and um, we're going to do the what do you know test here to start with and then we'll dive into this other one. This is going to be a little more advanced than what we were uh, doing yesterday. You know, some of that stuff yesterday was very uh, basic. How far apart are the firing events and degrees of crankshaft rotation on a six-cylinder engine? 120 degrees or 100 what? 122 or 120 degrees? 120 degrees on a four-cylinder. 180 an eight-cylinder and a ten-cylinder. Yeah. So basically, how do you arrive at those numbers? How do you arrive at those numbers? Divide it by the number of cylinders, and you wind up with how often a firing event happens. And so, uh, basically, think about a four-cylinder. Uh, it fires, and then the crankshaft turns fully from 12 to 6 on the clock before it fires again, and then it turns from 6 to 12 before it fires again. So you're firing, and uh, what's usually what's usually the firing order on a four-cylinder? On a four-cylinder, inline four-cylinder, what's the firing order usually? I'm not talking about a Volkswagen. That's different. What? Yeah, one, three, two, four. Yeah. So, all right. What are the companion cylinders on a four-cylinder? The companion Yeah, the ones that are going up and down together. One and two. No. One and three. One and four. One and four are going up and down together. When four is on com exhaust, one's on compression. When four is on compression, one's on exhaust. Two and three are going up. But if you look at them, you know, the, the one and two are doing this, and three and four are doing this. But because of that propensity of that thing to jump up and down, a lot of times four cylinder engines have got to have a balancer on them so that they don't, you know, shake the steering wheel and stuff. I mean, a lot of the, we had complaints whenever the Ford Contour first came out, it was a Mazda platform. And we would have a lot of people complaining about on the four cylinders about the steering wheel. Is all that still the same for like a boxer engine? Just about everything. If it doesn't have a balancer, you know what I'm saying? If it doesn't have a balancer. And it also depends on how the engine's mounted and there's other dynamics at work. But, uh, okay, let me ask you this. Let's say that you had an 8 in Ford tractor, which is an old Ford tractor, flathead engine and all that kind of stuff. I had one out here. Okay, well, see, I, see what I did to solve this problem. Okay, so uh, first uh, he said my tractor quit in the field. This is actually, believe it or not, the president of the college. He had an old ratty old 8 in Ford tractor. He was using to plow it to plow. Uh, Bob? Yeah, what's up? Do uh, you think you got time sometime before lunch to put a patch on the tire? Uh, probably. You just, have you just got the tire or what? No, it's on, it's on the car. The tire is flat. It, it's yeah. got a hole in it somewhere. I just can't okay. Um, park it out there and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Are, are, are you from ACR? Yes, sir. You look like one of those guys. Okay. Yes. All right, park it out there. That All one right. guy y'all got over looks like a guy from Diesel. You know that big guy? He looks like a Diesel guy, you know, just yeah, for some reason. Yeah, you know, All right. Doesn't he look like a Diesel guy to you? Yeah, he does. He favors Diesel guys. Well, park it out there. We'll see what we can do. Okay, he's in it. Yep. That, uh, Malta. Yeah, that's two of them we need to fix flats on. we got to get Miss Goosby's car. The key's in the glove box. we got to get the flat fixed on that. And we got, you know, he is too. Anyway, uh, so I've got this 8 in Ford tractor. Uh, after one of my students went over and got it out of the field, he says, I want to see if I can get it tuned up and everything. So I went ahead and, you know, put points and uh, condenser and pull a distributor cap off and got him some cap and some wires and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine, but wait a minute. I've already pulled this thing apart. What is Sam Hill's the firing order? <laughs> it ain't the same as any other four cylinder, you know. So how do you find out what the firing order is if you're sitting here with no shop manual, no access to information, you know? Nothing on the internet then. I mean, not in those days. You couldn't uh, get it that way. You you're, it's just you and the world, man. you got to come up with a firing order, an accurate firing order. This is a healthy engine, and it needs the plug wires put back on it the right way, and you want to do it the first time. You don't want to have to swap and try and Check hear backfires out the intake. Uh-huh. Check which cylinders hit top dead center in what order. Well, what I, yeah, that's right, but how do you do that? Huh? You said it's taken completely apart already. It's already took apart. I mean, I was the dummy that took it apart. I had all this stuff apart. Wait, what am I going to do? Take the plugs out and put a piece of wire in there. That's not a bad idea, but what I did was I took the plugs out and I put my fingers in there. Because I could do that. Which one yeah, and I said, spin it over. Puff, 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 puff. Oh, yeah, I know what it is. <laughs> you could feel it, how the order that they were puffing. See? Come on in here, Alice. Hi. Come in here, come here. Is this your proof? Uh, part of them. Uh, some of them are over getting IDs and getting books from the bookstore and this kind of thing today. Okay. Yeah. Well, I brought my whole rack over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was skipping. Mm -hmm. Y'all hearing me? Skip, skip, skip. Yep. 
for about a mile. Then he quit. Drove beautifully all the way. Yeah. I don't know. I had it parked for Does a while. it always do that when you first crank no, it? No. This is new. Huh. And when I drove it the other day, it skipped the whole time. Really? Yeah. Today, just a mile. Then it was smooth. But the light, check engine light, stays on. But huh. it doesn't flip. That should point us to which cylinder is misfiring. A cylinder is misfiring. Yeah, one cylinder. you got eight, and one of them is not carrying its share of the load sometimes. So we have an intermittent misfire on cylinder number something. We don't know which one. Okay. okay. And that is a 2000 Lincoln? Yeah. Yeah. That old jump thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm about to burn it. Yeah. But I know, but we had to put some springs under there for you and everything. It was doing well. I tell you, I, I dropped the Honda for a long time and it stayed parked uh -huh. with a tank full of gasoline. Oh, well, that's not a bad plane. If it's got a tank full, it's not as likely yeah. to go rotten. Of course, if it does go rotten, you got big trouble. Well, it may have gone rotten. Who knows? With well, it wasn't rotten. parked long enough to go rotten. Okay. Because you only parked it for about six weeks or something. Oh, about, not about three weeks. About okay. three weeks? Well, you're not going to have rotten gas in three weeks. Okay. If you do, you got got in trouble. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, do you want to send somebody over there with me? What I'm going to do, uh, yeah, we can probably make that happen. Uh, what? Yeah. What? Well, uh, let Melissa drive you back over there. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead and make the work order and shoot it down there, and then you can sign it at your convenience. Okay. Uh, what I was going to say is the airbag stays light. Stays on we need time. to check the airbag. Listen to this, guys. We need to check her airbag light and see why it's on. She'll, that's that's going to be a nice expensive repair probably, and then we'll go ahead and, and look at her, uh, you know, see which cylinder is misfiring. Also, uh, when they fixed the, whatever it was they fixed the last time I was here, mm -hmm. when I put it in reverse, it doesn't go in reverse. It's mm, in other words. In other words, when you put it in reverse, the the, the uh, I have well, to shift it up a little out of reverse. So it's, it's not a, landing. There's where it's something. Supposed yeah, to there's something out of adjustment there. Okay. Thank you. Adjustment is the word I was mm -hmm. trying to come up with. Okay. All right. Well, Melissa, give her a ride over to the library and bring her car back, and uh, we won't get too far ahead of you. I'm oh, sorry. Wait. Oh, Richard, if it looks as if you're going to have to keep it overnight, please let me know because I don't want to walk home. Okay. I need to get a ride. Yes, I can understand that. Yeah, if you need to ride to the library, you'll certainly need a ride home, won't you? All right. Well, the library is on the outside of the excuse again. me for interrupting, guys. That's okay. But think of how much you've learned. Yeah. <laughs> Just with my process. Yeah, okay. All right. All right, so we just, we got to make her up a work order. Okay, now then, uh, what does the oxygen sensor sense? Uh, fuel and wow, listen to that. Okay, now, here's the key word, oxygen sensor. Now, you, you said something very interesting there. And uh, I've seen guys that were professional mechanics in a seminar before, and like in a training session, like when the car quest or whoever come around training. Uh, they'd say, you're looking at your oxygen sensor, uh, and it's actually switching from rich to lean all the time. It's got these little camel humps. And let's say somebody uh, somebody kills a spark plug. Okay, now what is your oxygen sensor going to do? Remember, uh, up to up to the high numbers are rich, low numbers are lean on most of them. Okay, so if you're going, if this is this is basically the way it's going to look, it's going to do this. All right, that's going to be about one volt, and this is going to be zero volts, so that's 0.5, which is what it's basically going above and below that all the time. All right, so which way is it going to go? Is it going to go up when you pull that spark plug wire or down? It's going to show, well, why is it going to show lean if you pull the plug wire? Because you're not burning fuel. Not burning the fuel. Now, what you just said a minute ago was uh, it senses unburned fuel. Well, not by fuel. <laughs> it actually infers that, but it doesn't know what's going on. All it knows is that there's oxygen in there that's not supposed to be. Because, you know, you're actually taking hydrocarbons and, and uniting them with oxygen in order to, so that when the fuel burns, if you've got two uh, oxygen molecules hooking up with one carbon molecule, you get CO2. If the mixture's a little rich, you'll have CO. If the mixture's really rich, you'll have HC, which means no oxygen molecules will unite with that hydrocarbon. Uh, whenever it gets really hot uh, in the combustion chamber, like if the EGR's not flowing or whatever, you get NOx, you know, which is, we talk about that more on the emissions, but these are the emissions that we're fighting. 
They're also, remember this, you're making a gallon of water for every gallon of fuel you burn. You know when you crank it up in the wintertime, all that steam that comes out your pipe? That's there's right. always water coming out there. It's just whenever it's hotter, you don't see it, you know. So uh, keep that in mind when you crank one up and drive it a short distance because that blow-by is going to have water in it that goes by the rings. That's going to get down to the crankcase. And if you don't get it hot enough to where the PCV can steam that water out of there, it sort of dribbles into the oil, and then the oil and the water mix, and it turns into sludge, which is really nasty. More rich. Yeah. So you, you were saying when it's hot, it does the water thing. And what about when the engine and the temperature around the car is cold? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's always making water. Your engine's always making water okay. when it runs. Do you have to adjust like the... You're not really adjusting how much water is made. No, no, no. I mean like the, uh, the air fuel mixture. The air fuel mixture is always being adjusted in response to the oxygen sensor. All, all the right. time. So what's it doing when it's cold? Huh? What's it doing when it's cold? Whenever it's cold, it's an open loop. And it basically is going to put in there what it needs to... But these heated oxygen sensors... They start to heat up really fast, and usually within 60 seconds of you starting that car, that oxygen sensor comes online. And in the olden days, when they had to depend on exhaust heat to heat the oxygen sensor, it took it a while to warm up. And on, on, on early on, when we used to have to do our, you know, our uh, key on engine running tests and all this kind of stuff, it would tell you to rev the engine up for three minutes at 2,000 RPM and hold it steady, and that heats the oxygen sensor up, and that way you know it's switching like it's supposed to, and then it does its test. Anyway, the oxygen sensor, in a word, and I think everybody's on the same page here, senses oxygen. So it doesn't smell fuel. It doesn't care about anything else. All it's looking at is oxygen. Just keep that in mind. So how does the powertrain control module control the amount of fuel delivered to the cylinders on a fuel-injected engine? How detailed is an answer to Well, <laughs> well uh, basically, just a fairly simple answer will work. If the PCM wants it to get more fuel, what does it do? Flashes to the injector, a longer pulse width. Bingo, pulse width expansion on the injector. That's all there is to it. That's a simple, quick answer. Less is more in situations like this. I put a folder on that computer out there that says for Beck, and I opened up all those links. For every subject, not just every course. Right. Now, on the manual transmission, you'll have to click on one of two, but you'll find your tests with me talking about them in there. Okay. You know what I mean? Did you unlock the YouTube on the computer? They're on that computer, huh? What now? Did you unlock the YouTube for the computer? Yes. Now get that set of headphones over there and plug them in. You ought to be able to go, you're good to go. Do the one for today for you. Your test for today is uh, going to be automatic transmission. All right. I haven't done any of my tests so far. So. Uh, well, you, you better get on them. You know, or we'll just do, demote you from doctor to nurse. All right. Now then. So the first one was just aggravating me, so I quit doing it. I did some of it, and then the second one, I didn't have videos for. You do now. Rest. You do now. All right. So anyway, now uh, I'm in the middle of something, so let me let me get on with this. Let me ask you this question here: How is fuel delivery during engine starting different from fuel delivery right after the engine starts? Well, when it first starts, Yeah, not necessarily hosing, but putting more. And, the story I tell about that was, this is the thing, whenever you're uh, first, what, what, who has driven a vehicle with a carburetor on it? Okay, what do you have to do when you first get in a vehicle with a carburetor? you got to tap the gas. Well, when you hit the gas, you're wetting the manifold with the accelerator pump and you're closing the choke. You fire it up, the choke opens about an eighth of an inch if everything's working right, and then within a minute or so, it's wide open. So, what are you going to do on a fuel-injected engine? It's the same way. Did you know that if you're tapping the gas whenever you're starting a fuel-injected engine, you're adding extra injector pulses and putting more gas in there? Because whenever you, if you ever, if you can watch that when you operate the gas, it goes, it puts extra pulses in there. I mean, and the, the accelerator pump function is done electronically on a uh, on one of those. This is one of those things where they've opened the gate, and now we've got all kinds of work we're going to have to do. Uh, so anyway, the, this uh, little uh, Altima came in here. There was like a 97 model. And they says, we've had this thing at such and such a shop over in Andalusia for a while, and he's wanting to charge us $500, but he still hasn't fixed the car. And when he spins it over, you know, he goes, well, it, it spins and spins and spins and spins. And uh, then he said, said when he, if you can ever get it started, it'll usually start pretty decent for the rest of the day, but it's still not right. And so uh, I got it in here and was thinking about it and 
uh, checking things out, looking at fuel pressure, and you know, and all that kind of thing. And then finally, I said, "Well, um, I wonder if it even, I wonder how it knows when you're starting the car to give it those extra injector pulses to wet the manifold." So I got over here to the pin 21 on the engine controller that was supposed to go hot when you turned on the key, and I got a little test light, touched it gently so as not to spread the terminals, and we turned it to the start position, and we had nothing there. So I looked at the schematic and I tracked it back and there was a fuse missing. Somebody had pulled that fuse and put it somewhere else. <laughs> uh, probably pulled the fuse so, and put it in the radio. So when we put that fuse, yeah, probably. So when I put that fuse in there, or the cigarette lighter, I put that fuse where it was supposed to be, it goes, boom, busted right off. So all we had to do was put a fuse on there. Well, the guy that was working on it was an older guy and he just, I talked to him on the phone and he was scratching his head and said, well, I'm, I got another computer to put on there, but I didn't change anything and all that. You know, it's just, he was sort of throwing up his hands because he really didn't know which way to go. But you think about it a while, let it sit over, and, you know, and just think. You know, put kicking it, I'm not kicking a can down the road, even though it may look like it. A lot of times I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do about this? You know, you're, you've got to keep your mind working all the time. So anyway, uh, that's the other one. There was another lady that came here on a, uh, a doggone, uh, and Daniel probably heard me tell this story before. She came here on a uh, one of them little Chevrolet uh, Malibus or whatever it was Chevrolets, and uh, she said, uh, "I've had this thing all over Enterprise, and I've spent two thousand dollars on it, and they've changed mass airflow sensors, and they've done this, they've done that. I don't know what all they've done." I mean, to this shop and that one and the other one. Now, why people go to one shop and they don't get a yeah? They get they doesn't. It's not fixed, but they pay the bill and it does. It's still not, they go to another shop. I'll go back to that shop. Yeah, you go back to the same shop, make them you know hold their feet to the fire. All right. So long and short of it is, they're shopping around. Like if you buy something at Winn Dixie and you don't like it, next time you go to Walmart, I guess they're thinking that way. Well, anyway, she uh, this guy that I know that works for the government uh, USDA or something. He says, can you look at her car? Because she works here with me and she qualified for work. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So now I can't really say that I was sharp enough to where I caught this, but I did check everything. The exhaust wasn't stopped up. It wouldn't go for 40 miles an hour. Uh, and I said, this felt like a clogged exhaust or the engine's choking up or something. I can understand why people were fighting with it. But we were doing transmissions that semester. I said, you know, these guys need to know how to check the transmission fluid on one that doesn't have a dipstick, and this is one of those. And so I raised it up. You know, with the engine running and warm, you're supposed to pull that little plug and, and see if you can touch the uh, fluid. Yours is like that. Mm -hmm. That's all right. I'm over here shaking my head because I know all Yeah, already. so anyway, uh, when I took the tr that plug out, there was about a quart and a half of fluid ran out of there. <laughs> oh. And so somebody get the little uh, red cap that you take off to pour fluid in there, they feel like, well, we don't want to fool with checking it, but too much is better than not enough. So anyway, after we drained the extra fluid out of it, it ran like a new car. <laughs> wow. And all she needed was the fluid drained out. <laughs> but see, I can understand most of the time, and look, get this now, most of the time when a transmission is over full, it pushes a bunch of fluid out the vent and makes a mess all over the floor. But that one didn't do that. I don't know why. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't, unless it was choking it down because there was too much fluid and the pressure went too high and it was just holding it back. I don't know. But it ran good. She's, she hasn't, I haven't seen her since. Uh, and she just paid the basic charge for her bill, you know. Okay. It's really interesting on that. Whenever I drove that car, there was no jumping or nothing like that, and uh, it ran smooth, but her adjustment on her gear is pretty bad. Yeah, we need to fix all Whenever that. Whenever you're in reverse, it's showing you're in park, and when you're in drive, it's showing you're in drive. That's a fairly easy adjustment to make. When the engine when engine load goes up, which way does engine vacuum go? Down. Down. Okay, that's how your your mass airflow sensor, if you've got a modular valve on your transmission, it's actually using that propensity of engine vacuum to drop. How's a vacuum created anyway on an engine? The throttle plate's closed. The engine's constantly trying to suck air in there. In other words, it's making low pressure. And so you're basically choking down how much the engine can breathe and giving it just enough fuel to run cleanly and idle. When you open the throttle, the vacuum goes down, but more air flow's going in there, and you pick up speed and all that. On a diesel engine, you just give it more fuel. Diesel engines typically don't have to have a throttle plate, and that's how they work. Okay, so uh, when engine and air temperatures are cold, the air fuel mixture must be what? Richer or leaner? Richer. Yeah, that's right, because there's, you know, there's a bunch of factors that work there, but one of them is that cold air, uh, and, you know, a cold engine requires a rich mixture just because the way engines operate, too, 
they're gonna if you got a choke that's closed on one with a carburetor or if you got that extra fuel because the engine's cold engine coolant temperature is reading cold it's gonna put more fuel in there because that's just what the engine needs furthermore cold air has more molecules per cubic inch than hot air that's one of the reasons an intercooler works so well after you supercharge air and you're pushing it through an intercooler an intercooler is like a radiator for air so it's going through there getting cooled so and you know people talking about putting a cold air intake on stuff and all that. I've got all the parts to do it on Yeah, mine. that's, you know, this one guy put a cold air intake on one of them uh, uh, diesel, Cummins diesel Dodges. That's one of them uh, with a common rail injection, electronic fuel injection. He sends me an email through my website. He wants to know, you know, it's got a little bit of hesitation. In this. I said, wait a minute, you've changed the whole calibration of this electronic diesel and you want me to tell you what to do about that? He had put a cold air intake on it. Anytime you start modifying this stuff, you're subject to have check engine lights and issues you didn't have before. And then you want to call for the calf rope and get somebody to tell you just how to fine tune it. You know, if you start changing things, you're going to have to figure out what you you know on your own what to do. All right. Some people used to do it to try to bring them under warranty, want them fixed. They put different injectors, different throttle body, and they'd have a check engine. I don't want us to fix that. You know, sorry. Uh, as you apply throttle and increase engine speed with no load, what does the ignition spark timing do? Does it no, it actually, believe it or not, it advances with no load. If you're sitting here idling, and one of your sheets I gave you today is on set ignition time, and if you're idling, your timing is usually going to be bouncing around from about 8 to 14 degrees. Uh, as you go up on it with, with no load or a light load, your ignition time is going to happen faster. Why does it need to do that? Why does your ignition time need to advance as your engine speed increases? The one thing that you cannot control is how fast that fuel burns. Once that spark happens, in order to get the maximum power out of that punch, you're going to have to have it happen at the right time. If it happens too late, everything's running hot, you're not getting a, a, as much of a push on your piston. But if it happens earlier, uh, so that the peak of that pressure is happening at the time when it's going to give the piston the most of a push, then your, your time in advance. You can even listen to this engine on the stand out here run. It's 350. Crank it up with it running. Advance the time, and you'll hear it pick up speed so up to a point. If you go too far, it starts firing in the wrong places and go did. But my dad, when he used to sit in the timing, when he was, for a while he was working without a timing light for whatever reason, I don't know why. I mean, uh, it wasn't that he didn't know how to use one, he just wore his out and never ran around to buy one for a while. And uh, he would rev it up to about uh, probably 2,500 RPM and he'd advance the timing until it started cutting out a little bit and then he'd go back to the sound of good and he'd lock it down. <laughs> now you could get away with that on cars with carburetors and stuff on it, but they're more critical on the newer cars. Um, but anyway, the, you have to have it, and I'll tell you something else. When you're cruising down the road at 50 miles an hour with your foot barely touching the throttle, uh, you're going to have a time in advance that can be as much as 50 degrees before top dead center. It's really, really advanced a lot. If it's loaded now, it's going to retard some because if, it's, if it didn't, it would labor not. Okay, late valve timing and late ignition timing and EGR flow at idle all have the same effect on engine vacuum. What do they do? What does engine vacuum do when you've got late valve timing, late ignition timing, or EGR flow at idle? You're going to have low vacuum. What should the vacuum be on a healthy engine when it's idling? Some people ought to remember that. Remember, Daniel, what is it? What's that vacuum gauge show? 18 to 22 inches is healthy at idle. And if you got one that's idling and it's running bad and the vacuum is 10 inches, it's you know, engine vacuum is a good thing to look at because that's giving you a sort of a feel of how the thing is breathing. Um, okay, so yeah, it's not a bad plan on that. But now, sometimes I will tell you this: if you've got a massive vacuum leak of some kind, I mean a big one that's right close to where you're checking your vacuum, you may have low vacuum because of that. So keep that in mind too. Occasionally, that'll throw you a little bit. Well, then what that causes you? Your fuel, yeah, you're going to have all that going on. Now, I will tell you this. If you got low engine vacuum for any reason, your fuel trims are going to be crazy anyway uh, and all that. So, Okay, uh, what's meant by closed loop fuel control? Anybody know? O2 sensors being paid attention to. Yeah. The, uh, what you got here is you got your engine, and I'm just drawing a generic engine here that looks like Mickey Mouse, all right. and you got your engine controller, and your engine controller is controlling fuel, 
time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Incidentally, computers, when they're doing stuff, they always need feedback. They need to know. Like, if you, how do you know when your radio is too loud? Your ears tell you, don't they? You turn your radio back down. Now the ears are feedback, right? So the PCM's got a way it can look at stuff. And it, it monitors everything. But oxygen sensors, when you got exhaust coming out of this head, and I'm going to just put an oxygen sensor right here, it knows after the fact how it's doing as far as the 14.7 to 1 that it's looking for. That's the air fuel ratio stoichiometry. That's basically when it's like it's supposed to be. So as this shows that it's lean, it adds more. If this shows that it's rich, it subtracts some. That's your fuel trims. When its fuel trims are negative, it's subtracting fuel to correct for a rich condition. Whenever they're going positive, it's adding fuel to collect for a lean condition. So basically, that's your closed loop. Now, when you start the engine when it's cold, it's not paying any attention to the oxygen sensor. It's just using all the other sensors it has and doing what it knows it needs to do, which is what the fuel-injected engines did before they came out with oxygen sensors. The oxygen sensor, as far as I'm able to determine, first appeared on the Volvo in 1975, and they call it a lambda sensor. And nowadays, the way that your readings are on some of your tools, the 14.7 to 1, which is the perfect fuel trim, is actually indicated by 1.0 lambda. See, and it goes one way or another for that. So those things, those things are changing a little bit. In the olden days, General Motors used to call short fuel trim um, integrator and long fuel trim block learn. So don't get confused by those terms. If you see integrator, think short fuel trim. If you see block learn, think long fuel trim. Long fuel trim is a course adjustment that shifts everything a little bit to put stuff back in the middle where it's supposed to be. So you may look at your scan tool and see a short fuel trim reading that looks beautiful. It's at zeros, which it's supposed to be, you know, right close to zero. Your long fuel trim may be at 26, because one way or another, depending on what's going on, you know. All right, let's see here. Uh, Carburetors had an accelerator pump that applied additional fuel charge through squirt jets as the throttle was open. That's one of the ways we used to tell if one had gas in the carburetor. When you got a carbureted engine went to start, you hold the choke open, you move the throttle, and if you see gas go, psh, you know, you got gas. But if you do that and it doesn't do anything, well, there's no gas in the carburetor, no one will start. You know? uh, and always be careful to make sure that you know that on these little, uh, and I told Webb this, on these, these throttle body trucks like yours, if the, th if the spark plugs start to get a wet, little wet, it will blow fire out the intake, and you'll think somebody's crossed the plug wire on it during that. And he was working with a guy, you know, and he was telling me, this thing's blowing fire out the intake. We know we got the fire in order right and everything. I said, you got wet spark plugs. I mean, that is a peculiarity of that engine because we had one of those here. And I noticed that when the plugs would get a little wet, that thing would look like a fire-breathing dragon coming out of the intake. <clears throat> you know, if you have your head over it, you know, you're going to be smelling burned hair in the shower for a few days. <laughs> I mean, I've had that happen, you know. You ever had your hair singed? You know, you can shower four or five times and smell it every time, you know. All right, so. But anyway, how does a fuel injection engine change, uh, I mean, excuse me, handle the need for additional fuel during throttle opening? Additional injector pump squirts. Beep, 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 beep. That's what it does. Uh, why is it a good idea to check tire pressures on a vehicle when you're performing what customers in shop generally call a tune-up? Well, your tire pressure can affect your fuel economies. Most of the time, if they don't have tire pressure monitor, they're riding around with 20 pounds of air in their tire. Yeah, and if you, if you put air in those tires and they were half flat and they didn't know it, and yeah, you tuned it up, you cleaned the throttle body, you did whatever else needed to be done if it has a distributor with it and needs that you set the timing and all that. They take the car, not only does it run a little better because of the engine work you did, but now it's all crisp and everything because it's, and their fuel economy is higher. Yeah. My car, I noticed the fuel economy indicator on my Taurus had gone down from like 26 miles to the gallon on the average between here and Enterprise. It had gone down to like 21 or 22, and so one Friday I pulled it in here, and my tire pressures were like 24 <laughs> PSI. And my wife's Explorer never loses any pressure. We both got new tires. I don't get it. Can I ask you something? What? Mine, ever since last stuff started messing up, mine's gas, I can burn a quarter tank of gas coming from here to Andalusia. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you got to look at to make sure, you know. Uh, I had this one guy, we used to have this fuel economy uh, test thing that would fill up a, a bottle with a tenth of a gallon of gas. You turn some lever, and then you would drive until that tenth of a gallon of gas was gone. 
and then you would know by multiplying by 10 your odometer reading what the gas mileage was that you were getting while you burned in that tenth of a gallon of gas. That was a diagnostic tool we used at the dealership. And this one guy came up here and he rode the truck with me. I said, I'm going to drive the truck and I want you to watch this tenth of a gallon of gas and I want you to record what this truck's getting. And so he did the figures and he said, well, that's nearly 20 miles to the gallon that you got on that tenth of a gallon. I said, yep. Technician A says the first step in the diagnostic process is to verify the concern. Technician B says the second step is to perform a thorough inspection. Which That's a C, isn't it? That's both of them. A thorough inspection. Now, thorough inspection is going to be different based on what kind of problem you've got. If you've got a situation where your um, problem is happening intermittently, like if it happens sometimes but sometimes it doesn't, the smartest thing you can do is not touch a bunch of anything, just look. Because if you fool around and pull a wire harness away from somewhere where it's scratching against a bracket and then later on it works its way back over, you may think you got it fixed but you don't. See, so be careful about that. Make sure that, and if it's happening all the time, you know, let your fingers do the walking and work your way through the harness. Which item is not important to know before starting the diagnosis of an engine performance problem? The brand of engine oil. The brand of engine oil is not a big deal because all the engine oils have to meet the same specs. Uh, a paper test can be used to check for a possible problem with what? Yeah, what do you think about that? You like that? A good answer? All of the above. What does it feel like when you got a misfiring cylinder? Pop, 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 pop out the exhaust. If you don't know if it's misfiring, you remember that story I told about that Chevrolet S10 that came in there and it was feeling, you'd swear it had an engine skip. You just swear it had an engine skip. So I go to the, uh, and I, I kept fooling with this. I said, this really, it feels it's wiggling like it's got an engine skip. But for some strange reason, I'm confused here. It doesn't act like it. When I've killed the cylinders, they all sound the same. So I went to the pipe in the back and it was going, it felt like a skip, but it wasn't. And so before I got into that thing too deep, I'm at the Ford place working on a Chevrolet, right? You mean it. So I called Ted over to Chevrolet place to shop for him because I happen to know the guy. And I say, Ted, tell me about this S10 Chevrolet uh, pickup, little pickup feeling like with that 4.3 in it, feeling like it's skipping when it's not. He says, you won't ever fix that. He said, you may be able to put a motor mount on it that came, like with a Caprice takes, and you might make it a little better, but it's always going to feel that. When they start doing that, we had not never been able to figure out how to make them not do it. And so I gave it back to the dispatcher. I said, I'm not going to work on that thing. If the Chevrolet place can't figure it out, what am I doing with it, you know? i got other cars i got to fix. All right, so, any, and I saw another one in the used car department the same way. You know, the guy, the customer was talking to the used car mechanic, and it felt that way. And I said, you won't fix that. I felt that on another one the other day. And the salesman told the guy that was buying the truck, the best thing you can let me do is give you back your money for this truck and we'll take it back right now before you go off and get mad at us. Let's just come out of the sale. You know, how many car salesmen you know will do that? Yeah, and, but they would they would flatly do it over there. That was a good bunch of folks. Uh, anyway, um, which steps should be performed last when diagnosed as an engine performance problem? Hmm? What? Verifying the repair is a good answer. Talk loud. Technician A says if the opposite diagnostic trouble code can be set, the problem is the component itself. Now, what's he talking about there? Technician B says if the opposite diagnostic trouble code cannot be set, the problem puts the wire under the grounds. Okay, let's let's parse that. Let me show you what we're talking about here. Okay, and we're going to drop back to two-digit codes just so we won't get confused or whatever. Uh, you got a a code for your little TP sensor here. You got three wires going to that TP sensor. What are those three wires? All of them are basically going to the PCM. All right, voltage reference, signal, and signal return. Signal return is ground. VREF is the is the five volts. And let's rub out the word PCM so we can put signal here. Okay, this wire right here. As you move the throttle, it's going to go up and down from 0 to 4.6 volts, depending on where you are. 4.6 volts is wide open throttle, and, you know, about half a volt to one volt is going to be idle. It depends on which engine you're talking about. All right, so let's say that your code that you got from your PCM, your PCM tossed you a code to your scan tool, and we're going to say that is a, uh, 
I think it's like a PO 120 something. I can't remember. Uh, but if, let's say that a 53 means that the this voltage on the signal wire went high, and a 63 means it went low. All right. If you're getting a 63, and that means that that signal return wire is reading lower than its window. Its window will be in half a volt to 4.6. Let's say it's reading down around two tenths of a volt, and that's way too low, and it's not changing. For so, right, so what are you going to do to try to determine what's going on? I'm going to unplug my throttle position sensor, all right, and I'm going to, you know, switch off my car, and I'm going to jumper that wire, that signal wire, to the VREF. Okay, with a little jumper wire. It's going to take a little piece of jumper wire and gently stick it in there, make a little U, and jumper it. Now I turn it back on. Remember, I was getting a 63, which means it's below the window of where it's supposed to be. What should I get whenever I run the test again? I should get a 53. If I don't get a 53, what does that mean? you got a wire bed between here and here somewhere. You can track that down. All right, now then. What if my initial finding was that I got a 53, which meant the voltage was too high? The I'm gonna, well, not really. I'm going to jump over here then. I'm going to take right. that signal wire and I'm going to jump over here. Because if I'm seeing high voltage on this wire, I'm going to try to shut it to ground by jumping it to my signal return. All right, so if I do that, and then I get a 63, basically. See, if I can manipulate that at this connector, I know the sensor is bad. If I can't manipulate it, I know I've got problems over here. Now keep this in mind, this is really important. If I've got my sensor in here, and this wire, the signal return wire, is broken right there, what am I going to read on that signal wire? Huh? No. If, this, if the signal return wire, which is the ground, is broke, this wire and that one are going to be equal. That one's going to be reading 5 volts. Well, here, let me hit you with this other one. What if I look at all my sensors, and they're all supposed to be reading somewhere between a half a volt and four and a half volts, but they're reading like nine or ten volts. What the sound hill does that mean? I mean, I got a bad ground somewhere, bad engine, bad computer ground. All right, so that, that's that's is this is uh, this is down and dirty now. I mean, we're kind of taking off like a rocket here, but that's just you know we need to learn a lot this semester. And that's why I'm doing this. Okay, so let me see, technician, excuse me. So what do we got here? Number five. What's the right answer to number five? That would be C, wouldn't it? Yeah. Both of them. The preferred method to clear diagnostic trouble codes is to do what? Scan. Yeah. The best way to do is to use a scan tool. If you use the scan tool, you can actually go in there and find out what the codes are before they clear them. If you just jerk the battery cable, you don't know what code you cleared. I used to get really irritated when people would come over there and they say, my check engine light came on a couple of days ago and I pulled the battery cable and cleared the codes it hadn't come back on, but I need you to find out what was wrong. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, this airbag stuff, it was funny to me, and this is more of an automotive electronics thing. Uh, the airbag light on some of our earlier airbag cars would flash a code sometimes when there was a problem. And you could, if the customer had the, the, the savvy to count the flashes, they could come in and say, this thing flashes six times. Then you'd know what your code was. You see, or if it flashes three times and then two times if it was a two-digit code. Now get this: the record driver, the old man that had been working over a while, he was funny as all get out. He was driving one of the company cars, and he says, "This airbag light flashes sometimes." I says, "George, the next time it flashes, I need to know how many flashes you're getting. I need you to count the flashes." He says, "Okay, I can do that." And so he came back in there. It done it again. I says, "All right, George, how many flashes you have?" He says, "That light come on." And it flashed three or four or five or six times. <laughs> it's like he was deliberately trying to stir me up. <laughs> You're not helping me, George. But anyway, I finally found out what was wrong with it. Okay. Let's see. Which is a sca factory scan tool for Chrysler brand vehicles equipped with CAN? That's going to be a question. You, unless you had read that particular part of that chapter, you won't know that. But it's the star scan. That's what it is, a star scan. That thing's pretty cool. It looks kind of like that maxi dos I got, but when you pull up that thing, it gives you a network map right there on the screen of every every module, and there'll be 40, 50 computers on there that are all hooked together. It gives you a map of which ones are hooked to which networks and all that kind of stuff, because there'll be more than one network. And you say, let's say you want to talk to your uh, overhead trip computer module. 
it's a touch screen. You just touch the overhead trip computer module. Boom, it comes up. And then you've got to, I want to look at diagnostic trouble codes or serial data. Boop, boop, that comes up. It's cool as all get out the way they did that, but it's an expensive tool. Technician A says program, reprogramming a PCM using the J2534 system requires a factory scan tool. Technician B says reprogramming the PCM using the J2534 system requires internet access. Okay, who's correct about that? B is correct about that. J2534 is a pass-through programmer. I've got one out here that we use sometimes, and that's basically what that is. And let's see if we can punch through the rest of these. Technician A says knowing whether there's any diagnostic trouble codes may be helpful when checking for related technical service bulletins. Technician B says only a factory hand tool should be used for <laughs> retrieve DTCs. Yeah, that's a bunch of hooey. That's A. Always pay attention to your technical service bulletins. And if you've got one that you're fighting with and you're trying to figure out before you do anything else, I love to go into Identifix, punch that thing in, see what I see. Sometimes you'll go right to the problem by looking at Identifix, and you don't have to scratch around and waste a bunch of time. If you're in a situation like Daniel's working over there in the afternoons at Toyota, imagine yourself in a situation where you've got a problem. You can go there, find it, you know, to some whatever your resource is, find a TSB that says do this, this, and this, like the instrument cluster deal story I told. Uh, that's going to save you time. What method can be used to reprogram a PCM, offboard, direct, or remote? All of the above. Uh, which steps should be performed first when diagnosing an engine performance problem? That's going to be look at a, do a visual inspection. Open the hood and look around. A lot of the time people want to plug the scan tool in and see what they got. But if you plug the scan tool in and you get off on the wrong trail, you know, because you get confused, you can make yourself a bunch of extra work. So it's better to do a vehicle inspection and just look and see if anything's unplugged or, you know, messed up. Uh, this one guy went all over town trying to get his van fixed where it wouldn't cut up and buck and jump. Spent $725 at first this shop and then the other one. Said he came to the dealership last because he was afraid her bill was going to be so high. So I took the doghouse off that van and found that wire harness scratching on a bracket. Taped it up. Fixed the problem. And you know, his bill was like $25. A visual inspection will save you from charging the customer a lot of, of uh, big money too sometimes too. Okay. An ignition misfire or air fuel mixture problem is an example of what kind of uh, DTC? That's actually going to be a, a type A if it's an ignition miss. A type A is something that needs to happen, needs to be fixed right away. Uh, one of the reasons is because if you've got an air fuel mixture that's way out of kilter or a misfire, it can be a catalyst damaging event. Since the catalyst is covered for eight years or 80,000 miles most of the time nowadays, you're going to wind up the Warranty people don't want to have to buy another catalytic converter if they can get out of it. And so when that it, when they say when the check engine light starts flashing, you're supposed to stop. You know, uh, won't always damage a catalyst, but it can. That's the point. All right, let me see. Uh, check ignition. A says check coolant level in a radiator when it's hot. Hey, nice. yes. Yeah. 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 In about ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Technician A says check coolant level in a radiator when it's hot. Technician B says check coolant level in a radiator when it's cool. B. B. Well, you're going to check it when it's cool. The last step in the diagnosis process is which of these? The last step is, yeah, 14 is uh, verify the repair. Type A and B diagnostic trouble codes are related to what? Emissions. That's what they are. Some uh, DTCs require a certain number of trips before they'll set a code and turn on the mill. A type A code will set on which trip? First. And a type A code's a biggie. It sets on the first trip. Using the scan tool to clear a trouble code will also erase what? Freeze frame data, because freeze frame data is a little snapshot that your engine controller takes when the code is set. Let's say the code set and you want to find out what was going on when the code was set. You go into your freeze frame data, it's going to have about 10 different parameters that it took a picture of when that code set. And you can say they had, they were at 28% throttle angle, they were driving 62 miles an hour, the engine coolant temperature was 196. You can get all kinds of information. And uh, I had this one student that I put one of that little recorder under the dash. You know, it was uh, Zach uh, Miller. And he drove this vehicle down the road and back. When he come back, I pulled that little thing and put the thing in there. And I said, why were you going 80 miles an hour? 
He said, I didn't have any idea you'd have any way of knowing that. I said, good grief, boy. What's the matter with you? Anyway, so uh, let me get here. Engine spark should be checked. Of course, the speed limit out there is 65 anyway, but he didn't have a business going 80. Speed, the engine spark should be checked using what? Spark tester. A vehicle is being checked with a scan tool after sitting in the shop overnight. Key on engine off technician A says the IAT sensor and ECT sensor will read the same temperature. Technician B says these two sensors will read differently depending on barometric pressure. Which technician is correct? If you have two temperature sensors and that thing's been sitting more than about four hours, it don't matter if it's sitting in the sunlight or if it's sitting in the shop, they should read the same. If you see one that's reading 100 degrees and one that's reading 30 degrees, you know that you got issues. The one that's closer to the ambient is the one that's going to be right, and the one that's off the left, off in left field is the one that's going to, you can't trust. Now that's your last question, wasn't it? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Oh, would barometric pressure affect the map sensor? It will. It can. As a matter of fact, the map sensor is going to read. Sometimes if you've got, I knew about this one situation where this guy kept getting map sensors and putting them on there because every one he put on there was reading screwy. And uh, the guy that was standing there next to him says, why are you not thinking clearly about changing these map sensors? Did you look at the weather map? There's a hurricane right off the coast out here. And the pressure was different and the map sensor was picking it up. It's a barometer. You know, so if you get that, you know, if you're getting crazy pressures, pay attention to your weather map and see what the barometer is reading. That's the best way to do it. Thank mm -hmm. you.